Hi everybody. Um, I think we'll we'll probably uh, start uh, now. Um, I think we've got quite a few people already here. So um, just welcome to this webinar. Um, good morning or good afternoon to you wherever you are. I hope everybody's uh, coping well in in lockdown. If you are in lockdown and not going to stir crazy. Um, so my name is uh, Corinne Vaughan. Um, I'm a regional sales manager at Raytech, um, and I'll be going over this this webinar. Um, about seeing through uh, windscreens and lighting for intelligent transport systems. Um, just a few things to, to start off with. Um, we'll do questions at the end. So if you can note down any questions that you have during the webinar, and then you can use uh, the questions uh, side on uh, the GoToWebinar area, just to uh, write down your questions to me and we'll go through them um, at the end. Um, so thank you very much for, for attending and uh, we'll just start this webinar. Um, it's quite a specific and focused webinar, so it might be a little bit shorter uh, than what you usually expect, um, but it's very detailed on this sort of area. So we'll just start now. Um, so just looking at what we're going through. Uh, so the agenda. So the first thing we're going to look at is uh, why do we need to see through windscreens? Then we're going to look at the challenges uh, that that brings seeing through the windscreens, um, using different types of light and different types of wavelength. And then specifically, uh, we're going to look at 730 uh, nanometers and the benefits and drawbacks uh, to using uh, that wavelength in particular. So if we just start on with uh, why we need to see through windscreen. Um, so very much so we get uh, more and more requirements for driver recognition. So depending on the territory, of course, uh, we get more and more people asking us for this and it's a, a more and more popular. Um, there's a number of reasons why uh, people are needing to do this more and more. Um, one of them is um, it prevents drivers from passing the buck. So what we mean by this is um, any sort of uh, country where you have a, a point system on your license, uh, a lot of the times people try and get out of uh, uh, suspensions or points by saying someone else was driving the vehicle or that it wasn't them. Um, and with um, better evidential images and being able to see through windscreens, we uh, enable people to not uh, to not be able to pass uh, the buck onto somebody else and it gets uh, better results for all involved. Uh, another reason why we would use that is requirements for passengers as well. Um, so for example, uh, enforcing carpools uh, or HOV lanes, um, but mostly uh, we've done a lot of applications with carpool. So we've had the, uh, applications in Europe where um, the customer needed to make sure there was multiple people in the vehicles at all times. And they were doing that through seeing through the windscreen and they wanted to make sure it was a clear image. So there was no doubt and, and how many people were in the car or if there were people in the back of the car, that type of thing. And another reason why uh, was be to enforce uh, the uh, seat belts or also that people aren't using their mobile or their cell phones um, uh, while driving. Um, we've had applications, for example, in the Middle East, which was solely based on making sure that everybody in the vehicle was wearing their seat belts. So just uh, going through this, an example of a carpool application. So um, just to show you a bit of an example, um, on the left, uh, the image uh, with the green circle, so the, well, the green, not circle, the green rectangle um, is uh, the analytics working and being able to detect if there's one or multiple people in the vehicle. So in this case, if uh, the image was not good enough, the analytics would simply not work or they would be faulty um, and you would raise a lot of false alarms. So that's why it's one of the applications where it's important for us uh, to be able to see clearly through the windscreen and to be able to get a, a clear-cut image. So the challenges, so there's a, a few challenges and um, we'll go through um, some of the main ones. Um, I'm sure some of you have, have had these challenges in, in the past but we'll, we'll look at them in, in more detail uh, in the next few slides. So the first main challenge that we have is power. So um, seeing through a windscreen requires significantly more power than usual CCTV applications or even A and PR applications. Uh, it's very important to know that you need a lot more power. One of the reasons why you need more power is that um, certain wavelengths of light are blocked by the windscreens. So UV lights are, are blocked by the windscreen, so UVA for long wave or UVB for short wave. 
and uh, most wi uh, windscreens are designed um, to reflect um, IR to keep the cabin cool, which is great for the driver, but not so great for seeing through the windscreen. So those are some of the main reasons. As I say, UV and IR to keep the cabin cool. So just as a, a few uh, images of testing that we've done. So I'm going to go through quite a few images of testing that we've done to show you some sort of real life situations. Um, this one, the first one that we're looking at, is just to show how much more power you need to see through the windscreen. So on your left, you've got a high end security camera set with a 11000 shutter speed. Um, for all of the images that I'll show you that we've done in testing, we'll be using the 11000 shutter speed. And I'll be talking a lot about uh, the importance of shutter speed a little later on in, in the presentation. But in these two images, it's the, it's the same camera with the same shutter speed, so the same exact setup. And then in the on the left image, it's built in IR only. So if we were looking at an ANPR uh, application, then the image on the left uh, would be a good image. You would be able to use that. There'd be no issues with that. Uh, but on the image uh, on the left, you would definitely not be able to see who's in the vehicle. You wouldn't be able to see through the windscreen. By adding a Vario illuminator, in this case, it's our Vario 2 i8, which is a 50 watt illuminator, you can now see through the windscreen. Um, in this case, the image isn't that not a crisp image, but we'll see later on in the presentation how to make the images better. So we can see a big difference. Um, just to highlight the difference that you can see um, and how much more power you need on scene. So this is a, the image that we've just seen um, with the vehicle and seen through the windscreen. And then I'm going to show you the same image with the driver's head out of the window. Um, and that will just show you how much overexposure there is. Um, so that just shows how much more power we are using in order to get that image through the windscreen. So you can see when he puts his head out of the window, we can't see him, it's completely overexposed. So you need a lot more light. How much more light you need will completely depend on uh, your application. A second challenge uh, that we have is daytime. So um, most uh, most of us have uh, done CCTV applications or transport applications in terms of ANPR, and we are used to the issue being at night. Um, the issue is at night. You need to be able to get good uh, lighting to be able to see uh, difficult situations at night. In this situation, in for windscreens, um, the issue is daytime. Um, it's completely opposite to what we're used to, and the main issue is um, daytime. Um, one of the reasons why is more ambient light means there's more reflection. Um, so you can see in that image on the right that there's a lot of reflection, reflection on that. Um, one of the worst case um, scenarios for, for us for seeing the light, for seeing through the windscreen um, would be a sunny day uh, with a little bit of uh, broken clouds. So you'd get a lot of reflection, but also parts of the windscreen would still be OK to see through a little bit like in that image. Um, so there'd be some areas where there'd be a lot of reflection and some areas where it would be fine. Um, and that would make it very difficult for us to see through the windscreen or for anybody to see through the windscreen because each part of the windscreen would be um, very different. Um, add a little bit of wind into that and then you'd have the clouds moving around and then it would change which part of the windscreen would be affected by the reflection. So it's very important to know um, that it's very difficult to get quality images in daytime in these types of situations when you wanted to see through the windscreen. So how would you go about uh, solving that issue? Well, one of the, issue, one of the ways is um, using polarizing filters. So this can help to overcome the problem. Uh, the pos polarizing filters, um, they remove the polarized light and they reduce reflection and glare. So I've got a couple images here, which will show you how that helps. So on the left is the image that we saw previously without the polarizing filter. And on the right is the image with a polarizing filter. So you can see uh, very clearly that the reflection is, a, um, is not an issue in, uh, anymore in the right hand picture. Um, and it's a usable image that we can work on. Now that image, on the right is a usable image. We still probably can't see the details of the driver, um, but now we're going to look at how we can use this image and make it better. 
So how are we going to do that? So we have to add more light, more power. So like we talked about initially, one of the challenges is that you need more power. In the daytime, you need even more power in order to get there. So on the left is that image with no light at five meters. And on the right is five meters with two Vario 2 I8s. So now you can see a lot clearer, you can see the driver. And just to highlight how much more difficult it is in the daytime, um, if you compare to the images uh, we showed of nighttime where we were using one unit to be able to see, now we're using two units to be able to see. Um, so you need a lot more power. One of the reasons why you need more power is because the ambient light level uh, during the day is very high. So you need your peak power levels to be even higher. Um, at nighttime, obviously, the ambient light would be lower, would be very low. So your peak power would also be lower. Another couple of examples um, now, so we're able to get even clearer imaging is um, the same image with the five meters with no light. And now we've got an image with four Vario 2 I8s. Um, so now we have even more power. We've doubled the power, um, which means that we're getting even clearer image. We can see more detail in the car and the passenger, and we can really recognize the, uh, the driver or if there was a passenger, the passenger. So the good news with this is that we can really get good images. Um, the bad news is that we need a lot more power um, and it's a big consideration that you need a lot more power in order to see. Another challenge that we're going to look at is um, tinted windows. So um, the tinted windows, they block out even more light. Um, so it's even more difficult to see. And depending on the country, you can have certain levels of tints before it becomes illegal. Um, I know each country is different in terms of the windscreen, but also in terms of the front side uh, windows, but also the back windows. So for example, um, in, in France, I know there's less regulations on the back windows than there is on the front windows, which means that the back windows uh, can be very tinted, but the front ones can't. So if you wanted to have an application where you needed to see through the windscreens, through the windows and through the back windows, then obviously you would have to have very different type of light and power for each one to see through them. I'm just going to show you a few examples of this one as well. So what we've got here is on the left, we have got a um, window with no IR, a full tint window with no IR. And on the right, we've got the full tint window with four Vario 2 I8s. So if you remember, that was the number of uh, I8s we had on a really good crisp image that we had beforehand. Um, so using the same amount of power as we did to see through the windscreen in the initial one, during the daytime, we're now trying to see through a full tint window and we can see that it's very, very difficult for us to see through. So you can just about see um, the, the passenger at the back, um, but we can't see any of the details. It's much more difficult for us to be able to, to de detect people around the back. So just to summarize um, some of the challenges that we've just talked about, um, you need significantly more power, whether that's nighttime or, or uh, daytime, um, compared to standard ANPR applications or compared to CCTV applications. Um, reflections make it really difficult uh, for us to get quality images during the daytime. So we need uh, to make sure that we combat that with the polarizing lenses. Um, and also tinted windows, they restrict even more so the amount, uh, the amount of light that gets through. And you would need even more power to get through tinted windows. So what's the solution? So now we're going to look at the solution. So the solution would be, obviously, that you would need more light. Um, so we're going to look at that and how that is going to affect it. but also um different types of light so we're going to look at that in more detail and um, what kind of lights we can use and what effects those types of lights have um on seeing through the windscreen so we're going to look at 730 nanometers um, um and how that gives us the better results or the best results. But before we do that, I just want to talk a little bit about different wavelengths that we can look at and what ones are standardly used. So what type of light should I use? So 
transport applications in general and even CCTV applications uh, traditionally use 850 uh, nanometers. So that's what's standardly used in most applications. It's uh, the semi-covert. Um, so when you look at 850 nanometer, most of you, of all, well, I presume already use 850 nanometer, you can see uh, a faint red glow. It's what we call semi-covert and it's what is used in most applications. Some windscreens um, will, however, block IRAs and therefore make it uh, more difficult. So which other types of light would give us better results? So if we look at the theory to start with, I've got this graph here um, and it sh it's showing you different types of windscreens. Um, so the gray line is a standard windscreen and the red line is a, a thermic windscreen. So it's two different types. Um, so we can see from, the, from a standard windscreen perspective, um, the different wavelengths and the reflection that you get. Uh, with those types of, uh, of uh, windscreens. So with the standard ones, um, it's pretty much the same for all the wavelengths. It's pretty low reflectivity. Um, and if all the cars were had standard windscreens, then we would be able to standardize uh, a solution and would be fairly easy to use uh, the same sort of light for each application. The problem is, is when you have different types of, uh, of windscreens and in the case of an, a thermic windscreen, um, you can see that the reflectivity is completely different based on the wavelength. So if we look on that graph, it would say that between 600 and 700 nanometers looks to be the ideal uh, wavelength to use. The problem with that is that it's completely visible light. So uh, between 600 and 700, it's a, it's a red light, you would be able to see it, it's very bright um, for the driver. Um, so it's probably not something that you would be able to, to use um, in your applications because of that. Um, but then you can also see that when you go to 850 nanometers, that the reflectivity is very high. Um, and so then that's gonna be a bigger challenge to be able to use that type of wavelength. So we're just going to look at a couple examples of different wavelengths and um, what we've got here. So um, we've got four different types of examples. So we've got the top left, which is standard IR, the 850 nanometers. Uh, top right, which is covert IR, which is 940 nanometers. Bottom left is white light and bottom right is called red, which is 730 nanometers. Um, so if we go through them individually, so we talked about the standard IR, which is 850 nanometers, which is the semi-covert, which is used uh, in most applications. If we look at that image, it's uh, it's a good image. You can see the number plate, you can see through the windscreen. Um, there's not a lot of detail, but you can still get um, some of the information that you need. Um, when you move over to the covert IR, um, we can't see much at all in terms of seeing through the windscreen. It's very difficult to see. Um, the main reason for this is camera sensitivity to 940 nanometers is quite low. So it's very difficult to get good results with this type of light. Um, 940 is normally used predominantly in rail applications because it's near invisible. So you wouldn't have that effect of that small red glow and it wouldn't be uh, confused with a, with a light or a traffic light. Um, and this is often only a concern in high speed applications in rail. Um, so most applications in, in transport, in traffic, um, in cars, et cetera, um, would be used in 850 nanometers anyway. Bottom left, we get a good result with the, with the white light. By white light, we mean um, that it's um, visible light, like a torch, um, and it's um, very well, it's basically visible light, um, like the light you're used to. Um, and we can see that it's a very good uh, result. But obviously, for obvious reasons, white light is not something that we'd be able to use to see through windscreens, just because obviously you're flashing a light right at the driver, which would be dangerous and also would blind the driver. Um, and it's just not something sustainable which is, I know some of you might use white light for number plates, which is slightly different because you can um, put it, install it differently to be able to do that. But for seeing through the windscreen, it's probably not a feasible um, solution. And then bottom right is the red, which is the 730 nanometer, which is the one where we get the, the best results, um, where we get a little bit more detail from the, from the driver and from the passenger side as well. 
Um, but on this image, you would probably see there's not that big of a difference between the 8.50 and the 7.30. Um, when I show you the next example, this is when we really start to see the difference. So now this is the side of the vehicle um, with, again, the same four examples. So now when you look at the top left image, before you look at any of the other images, you can you would think that that maybe is an empty car. You can't really see anything around the back. You can sort of see maybe a faint person in the back uh, seat. But in general, it's, it's very hard to see. Top right, a covert and bottom left white light. We've already we sort of talked about why they wouldn't be really used in this application. So I'll just leave them for now. Um, and then in bottom right, we've got red, uh, which is 730 nanometer. And this is when we really see the difference between the standard IR and the, and the 730 nanometers, where you can see the person sitting in the back and you can see a lot more detail. You can see through the car. So if there was other people on the other side, you might be able to see them too. Um, so it's very um, important to see the, the difference. Now, if we just look at those two examples zoomed in, uh, between 7.30 and 8.50. Um, so this time 7.30 is on the left and 8.50 is on the right. So when it's zoomed in again, you can see a lot more detail when you go through the windscreen. So a lot more um, information. As I've mentioned previously, all of the images that we use are uh, with a 1 1,000th shutter speed um, for fast moving vehicles. But if you use the slowest shutter speed, you would get uh, better images. But I'll talk about that later on and we'll show you a bit about that later on as well. And then zoomed in on the side, the comparison side by side, again, of the standard IR and the 730 nanometers, you can see again the, the big difference uh, between those two. Sorry. Um, so uh, 730 nanometers, just to recap the benefits and the possible limitations of this. So um, talked about, we've seen how the cameras are much more receptive to 730 nanometers and how you get much better images. Now, the challenges with 730 nanometers is that it's a visible red light. So when we talk about the 940 being completely well near invisible and the 850 having a faint red glow, the 730 is very much a visible red light. So it would be restricted in its use in certain applications. Um, not as... Um, bad or as hard to use as visible white light, but it's still something visible. So it's, in certain applications, it might not be suitable for that application. So it's very important to understand these limitations um, before you sort of specify this type of lighting. Um, because of that visible red light, it could distract the driver or create any sort of, any sort of issues with, with them being able to see that red light. Other considerations that we need to take in account of um, when they're seen through windscreens. Um, so I've been talking about it a little bit, but is um, sort of shutter speed. So we're just gonna talk a little bit about the, the shutter speed that we use. Um, so all our testing has been done with one one thousandth um, because that is high speed application. So for us, that is what we would say worst case scenario in terms of visibility. Uh, but not all of the applications would use one one thousand. Not it's not necessary for all applications. For example, on the right, this image here is an installation at Heathrow Airport, which we've done, uh, where you can see the the Raytec lamp is installed at the bottom of that column. Um, and it's just sort of entry of the car park. Um, in that application, the, cl the cars would be moving fairly slowly, um, wouldn't be going fast at all, maybe even static. Um, and in that case, you might be using a much um, smaller shutter speed. So um, standardly for CCTV or slow moving traffic, we might be using 1 50th instead of 1 1 1,000th. So because we've got that lower shutter speed, um, we would get better images in terms of we would need less power to get a good image. Um, it might not be a better image, but it'll be an image that needs less power to get to the point where you can use make a usable image. Just to explain that a little bit further, um, we've got a little image here which um, emphasizes the faster the shutter speed you use, um, the less light you're going to have or less usable light the camera is going to have. Um, so on the bottom right, you've got one over two. Uh, which is a lot of light, a lot of visibility. Um, you can see the image quite uh, very clearly, all the uh, all the light. And then 
top left, one over 250, um, you're going to have uh, an image which is a lot darker in this case. And just to explain this in the context of uh, transport and traffic, um, we've got an example here of, of cars going at 70 miles per hour, or if you have 112 kilometers an hour. So with the 150th shutter speed that we talked about, um, where you would let, need less power to get a good image, um, the reason why you wouldn't use it in high speed applications is because of the motion blur. So in this situation, the car would travel 62 centimeters uh, but when, between when the shutters open and shut. Uh, every time it opens and shuts, it travels 62 centimeters, which would create that travel, uh, which would create that motion blur. So that's why you would use a quicker shutter speed in order to avoid the motion blur. So in this case, with 1 1,000th, it would only travel three centimeters. And because you were using that quicker shutter speed, the amount of light needed is a lot more. So in this case, you would need 20 times more light than in the standard CCTV application um, to be able to get a good image. So it's very important to understand by, shutter, by changing the shutter speed, you would need, again, a lot more power in order to get good results. Another uh, sort of consideration or solution that we can look at is um, pulse lighting. Um, so we, all the examples that I've um, just gone through is all examples of constant lighting, whether that's 7.30 or 8.50 or 9.40, it's constant lighting. So the light is on at 100% all of the time that you specify it for it to be on. Um, pulse lighting is a solution that we can use. Um, where the light would be pulsed and it would be synced with the camera in order for the the pulse the light pulse and the shutter speed to be synced at the same time um, by pulsing the light um, we're basically effectively turning it on and off very very quickly this is completely invisible to the human eye and um, which means with leds you can drive those leds a lot harder when they're not on constantly so we'd get about four times the power um, when you're pulsing the light um, and obviously the leds wouldn't be affected by the on and off sort of system uh, i know with old school sort of light bulbs if you turn them on and off loads then you would uh, you would reckon but with leds it doesn't affect them at all and you would get that four times more power by doing that by driving them a lot harder when they were on and then when and then they would turn off on and off uh, really really quick as i can say um as i said that they, they wouldn't you wouldn't be able to see that with the naked eye you wouldn't be able to notice that and the advantage of this apart from having obviously a lot more light and a lot more power, is you would be able to condense that more light and more power in a, in a, in a smaller product potentially. Um, in a, we have sort of our pulse uh, range of products, um, which would reduce your sort of your application costs, but also by driving the LEDs on and off, it would bring down your energy um, and it would reduce your running costs of the, of the lamp as well. Um, and also you would be able to have the pulse lighting on 24 seven without um, having any issues with uh, sort of running costs. And actually by driving the LEDs and having them come on and off, it actually gives them a, a much longer uh, lifespan. So the life of the illuminator would actually be a lot longer. So that's what we would use. Um, just to note with our, with our pulse lighting range, you have to make sure you, you check um it's kind of uh, what camera you're using with it um making sure so with our sort of pulse lighting range you have to use ttl so just making sure that you use the correct um sort of cameras um to be able to sync that shutter speed with the pulse if you didn't sync it properly then obviously you would have pulse of lights which were out of sync with the shutter speed so it just wouldn't work at all just to sort of summarize a little bit what we've talked about um, so, seen through windscreens, it does present quite a number of challenges, um, as we've seen with the, with the power, with the daytime, um, with the polarizing lenses, having to use them, um, seen through different types of windscreens, tinted uh, uh, windows, etc. presents all, uh, all different types of challenges, as we've seen, so, and reflections. 730 nanometers does provide uh, the best results, but it's very important to see 
if it's suitable for your application, if you can use it, if you can live with the visible red light, if it's something that uh, works for your application. So yes, it works a lot better, but can it fit your application? And using the correct shutter speed is critical for you to be able to use um, the right um, amount of light. Um, as we said, if you didn't need to use a 1 1,000th shutter speed, um, then all you're doing is limiting um, the quality of your image or having to add more light to be able to go at that shutter speed. So it's very important to choose the correct shutter speed, shutter speed whether that be 150, 1 over 250, 1 over 1,000. It's, um, it changes uh, drastically the amount of light that you will need on scene. And finally, um, pulse light in is a solution that you can explore that can give you a lot more power and really uh, boost the amount of light that you have on scene and can help alleviate any sort of issues that you've had uh, previously. Again, post lighting is for specific types of applications. So you need to make sure that it's something that is suitable and can work for your application with your camera and your installation. So as I said, this very sort of short presentation on, on how it works. Um, I've now sort of ran through that. Um, so if you have any questions, then you can use sort of the, the question tab at the bottom and I'll, I'll try and go through them um, for you. And I've also provided my uh, email address there. So if you have any questions, you can email me and I'll either get back to you or forward you on to the relevant person or contact person that you have. So if you want to mark that down, you can write that down as well. Um, but I will just uh, put, see some questions here. Um, so let me just check. So I have a few questions here. So I've got a question about uh, what uh, nanome what wavelengths to use in fog, I believe. Yeah. So um, so for fog, it um, depends. Basically, every wavelength will be difficult for fog. So it depends how the conditions of the of the fog of rain, etc. Um, as we always say, if it's difficult to see with the naked eye, it's going to be difficult to see with a camera as well. Um, but obviously, um, again, you can still see and it can still work. It's just kind of thing that we need to you need to look into um, into more detail for your application. Uh, but as I said, it works with different wavelengths. You can use different wavelengths for that. It's not limited uh, to one specific wavelength. Um, but obviously, it will depend on how thick that fog is going to be in the application. I'm just going to look at more questions here. Just bear with me a little minute. So just check through there. Uh, so I have another question here. Uh, so somebody wanted to look at the few last slides. So I don't know if that means the pulse slide here or, or the summary slide, I presume. So I've just put the summary slide on there for you just so you can see. Um, somebody has asked, have you tested, um, let me just read that. So somebody's asking about color uh, cameras or black and white cameras. So all our um, testing with the, is, what we do is uh, with uh, sort of black and white cameras, but you can, uh, so for obviously for uh, infrared, you would use black and white cameras. Uh, can you provide any materials? Yes, we can um, share all of the materials that, we, that we're that we going to send to you. So we can share this presentation. We recorded it so we can send it to you and can share any information or any of the, the testing that we've done. Um, we also, for anybody who's not a native English speaker, we also have um, a presentation uh, in Spanish tomorrow, if that's of interest, or if you have any other uh, languages, then we can look into seeing if we can do the presentation in uh, different languages for you as well. So somebody's asked us a good, uh, an interesting question about if we've uh, tested with um, different types 
of tint and different types of uh, different types of brand and different types of window tint uh, as well as in darkness and in, um, as well as the darkness of the tint so that's an interesting question we've um, done testing on different types of, uh, of vehicles so they'll have different types of windows and tints um, we try and do as much testing as we can on different types but obviously it's uh, it would be different for every different type of, of tint. Um, but as I said, we've done projects in, in Europe where they had different cars and they've been using them on motorways with different types of tints on the windows um, and on the windscreen. We've done projects in the Middle East where they have, again, different windscreens and different um, tints as well on their windows. For example, in winds their windows are uh, often very tinted in uh, the Middle East. There's less restrictions on that. Um, so we've done a lot of different testing with a lot of different uh, applications. Obviously, we'd always recommend for this type of thing to do your own testing as well. Let's just check if there's any more questions. Um, also, if you, uh, I think a lot of you might be based in the Americas. So, if you are based in the uh, Americas, can you make sure you contact our US sales team? So, um, we can send over. We'll also send in our uh, feedback of this webinar. We'll send you some contact details. But um, it's very important to know, as I've just said, that transport application is very case by case, especially for Polestar. It's very case by case situation. So, we would want to work with you and and um, Specifying the correct units so very important for you to contact our um, our guys in the US if you're in the US or the guys in the European office if you're in Europe, just to make sure that you get the right uh, right products and right help with that. In terms, somebody's asked about uh, the different so the filter uh, so the polarizing filter is on the camera. Um, so I was asked about how to apply the polarizing filter. So the polarizing filter is on the camera and then all our lamps would be specified at a certain wavelength. So we would use a 850 nanometer, which would be 850 nanometer LEDs. And then a 730 nanometer would be 730 nanometer LEDs on that one. But the polarizing filter itself to avoid the issues during daytime would be on the camera. Somebody's also asked about rain affecting the image. So rain similar to fog, um, would uh, you would be able to see the rain on the image. Um, depending on how heavy that rain would, it would probably affect it less than the, the, the very strong fog. So again, it would depend on the situation. Again, it'll be down to um, comparison to being able to see it with a naked eye and also with a camera. Then looking to see if we've got any more questions. Um, so I've got a question here which says, is it possible to change angle of coverage and wavelength of illuminator over IP? Um, so we can't change the angle or the wavelength over IP. So the lamp itself would come in a certain wavelength um, and the angle we, for those of you who don't know uh, much about our products, um, whether it's the, the constant light or the pole stars, they have an interchangeable lensing system. So you can easily change the, the lensing on there, but you wouldn't be able to, um, you wouldn't be able to, you'd have to do that manually. You wouldn't be able to do that over IP. So at the minute, it's just a manual changing of the lensing. We have different uh, lensing available, uh, 10 degrees, 20 degrees, uh, 35 degrees in the pole star, but we also have uh, larger widths in, um, in the security range, which is the constant lighting barrier range as well. Somebody has asked about if the 730 nanometer IR is available in PoE, uh, powered by PoE. Um, yes, uh, we can use uh, 730 nanometers with PoE. Um, so that is um, basically all our, our vario range uh, you would be able to use with 730 nanometers. So in this example, for example, it was all I8. So if you wanted to power over PoE, you would be able to have a PoE I8 with 730 nanometers as well.
Uh, somebody has asked a question about uh, 730 nanometers outside of seeing uh, through windswing. If we've done any applications, uh, we have done uh, a few sort of um, applications um, with 730 nanometers, um, sort of machine vision um, type applications where they wanted a different type of wavelength. Um, we've also done applications with uh, blue light as well, which is less common. Um, so we are quite flexible. It's not just through windscreens, but the 730 nanometer is really something where we've used it in that one. And see if I've got any more. So somebody's asking about um, overexposure, I believe. Um, yeah, so, so I'm asking about overexposure of the number plate being a possibility when using the, um, I mean, trying to use more power to see for the windscreen. So yes, that could be a concern, but that's all about tweaking the installation and the application in order to be able to um, not have the plate overexposed. And so that you could be do that by moving the light a little further away from the camera and being able to be able to get the right amount of light to see through the windscreen, but also not overexpose the uh, number plate. So somebody's asked about uh, distances for 730 nanometers. So it'll be very similar to sort of 850 nanometers. Um, in order to get the best results, you would have to be, um, the closer you are, the more power you're gonna have. Um, so most of our applications or the examples that we've seen is between five, uh, five, 10, 15, 20 meters. Um, it depends on your application, but obviously that's why we would tell you to, to contact us to tell us exactly sort of distance and installation that you wanted so that we'd be able to specify the right amount of power and the right unit for you. So somebody's asking about how to sync the um, camera with the pulse lighting so that's done through a uh, ttl input so that's how they are linked together and then we have a, a web interface where you can sort of program how that would work on that one as well so for the pulse lighting again for pulse lighting make sure you you contact the the, the sales guys in the us or europe just to get a bit more information on that and whether it would work for your application Um, just a few more questions. Apologies. Um, if I don't answer all your questions, there's quite a few here. So what I'll do is if I don't get around to your questions, I'll make sure to somebody we get back to you with these as well. So somebody's asking about um, power consumption. Um, so the total power consumption, I presume, of the, the units, which type of units you will need and what typical power consumption you would uh, you would use, um, that is uh, completely dependent on application. So the examples that we showed you were all with 50 watt units, um, but obviously the you can use completely different um, units as well with different uh, power consumptions, um, much more or less. And obviously um, you would have uh, different ones depending on what you used or if you used multiple. So for example, with the image where we had the four I8s, that's 450 watt units that we were using. So basically 200 watts. Uh, yep, yeah, uh, somebody's asking about sharing the presentation again. Yep, they definitely will share the presentation with you and uh, try and go through all of this with you. Um, what I'll do is uh, I'll uh, think I've got through most of the most of the questions. Apologies if I've missed a, a couple of them. Um, but what I'll do is I will make sure we send this presentation to you. And if I haven't answered your question, then feel free to, to email me or we'll email you guys uh, back just to confirm the answers to the questions that you asked on the webinar. Uh, we'll be sure to do that to you guys. I'll just put the last slide on 
again just so you can get my email address in case you need it um but as i said um we've got uh, offices in the, in the us and office um uh, well offices in the americas and office in europe so we cover the whole world so wherever you are we'll have somebody who can um, assist you with, with your application and be able to help you with that so if there's uh any, maybe any more questions? I don't think there is. So um, I'll just end the, the webinar for now. And um, thank you very much uh, for attending. And as I said, if anybody's interested in, a, in seeing this webinar again in Spanish tomorrow, we have it on in Spanish tomorrow at the same time. So if you know of anybody who would rather have it in, in Spanish, then uh, please feel free to join me tomorrow and I will attempt to go through it in Spanish as well. So thank you very much, everybody, and have a, have a nice day.